all right, everyone. So we have many responses in the chat room. And I'm glad that we have a lot of people from around the globe. We have participants from Ghana, from Islamabad, from Hyderabad. From Nigeria. From Philippine, again from Pakistan. It's really good to see a diverse group. And uh, I welcome each of you at PPDCI conference. This is February 24, 2024, Saturday, and we are going to make the best out of the day, inshallah ta'ala. We already have begun the day with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I am so sure you know very well whenever we begin the days with the name of Allah Almighty, it's always something which is very empowering coming to us. Before we land into the session, I once again welcome you, and I would give you a rundown of the complete two hours when we are together. This is the welcome which would be done and then um, the rational by me for this complete conference. Our first presenter is Ms. Faiza Sumbul and uh, she's going to speak to us on personalized learning paths for educators. You will have some time for question and answers in case if you feel like having some questions, we are suggesting you to drop them there and there in the chat room. PPDCI team is actively noting the questions because then these will be referred to the presenters. Our second presenter is going to be Ms. Iram Kamran, and she'll be talking about integrating data-driven decision-making in educational leadership. It is going to be followed by Q&A, and then we'll proceed towards the closure. I guarantee you, the presenters we have today are going to take you through a complete journey, which is learning-oriented for all of us. Before we move on further, I would like you to know yourself, check in, Check in with yourselves. How are you feeling right now? How is your mood? How is your morale? What, what goals do you have for attending this complete conference? Because, you know, whenever you spare your good time, it's two hours which you're going to spend on the screen. So you need to check your mood first. So align yourselves with this learning path. And remember, whenever we learn something, we need to unlearn and only then learning happens. So fasten your bells and get ready for learning and unlearning process. A reminder for each of you that well-being is very important. Enhanced well-being means you matter actually. And this is you by the end who have, you know, you have got for yourself. So in the end, this is you who have got you actually. Another reminder to be kind to yourself and to take care of yourself because again, nobody else is going to come to do this for you. Happiness matters. Learn happily take points, explore this complete conference and ask as many questions as you can because the ultimate reason of happiness is that we have ample knowledge to survive in this world where we are surviving today. So ladies and gentlemen, esteemed educators from around the world, welcome to our virtual conference on empowering teachers leveraging leadership for instructional mastery. It is with great pleasure and excitement that we gather today, united by a common goal, the advancement of teaching excellence and the empowerment of educators worldwide. In our rapidly evolving educational landscape, the role of teachers as leaders in the classroom has never been more crucial. As educators, you possess the power to inspire, motivate, and shape the minds of future generations. Your leadership extends for beyond the confines of the classroom, influencing educational practices, policies, and ultimately the trajectory of society, the complete society. And throughout this conference, we aim to delve into heart of instructional mastery, exploring innovative strategies, best practices, and transformative leadership that empower teachers to excel in their craft from harnessing the latest advancement in educational technology to fostering inclusive and equitable learning environments. Our discussions will span a diverse array of topics aimed at equipping you with the tools and insights needed to thrive in today's educational landscape. So once again, thank you very much and welcome on board. Without much ado, I would like to hand over the stage to our very first presenter, Ms. Faiza Sumbal. This is her kindness that whenever PPDCI request her for an educational journey with all of you, with all the attendees and the trainees, she's available to educate us and to you know make ourselves the better version. 
So a high time for learning for me and for all of us. Her topic is going to revolve around personalized learning paths for educators. Over to you, Ms. Faisal. So until Ms. Faisal settles down her screen sharing option, I would like once again to reinforce the, the theme of the conference, which is empowering teachers and then leveraging leadership for instructional mastery. So the, the theme itself says it's trifold when we speak about number one, empowering teachers. So around the globe, those who are educationists need to be empowered in one way or the other way. And today we'll explore how their empowerment comes and what are the benefits of teachers being empowered in the classes? On the second, second era, on the second trail, we'll be focusing about leveraging leadership for instructional mastery. Ultimately, when a teacher becomes a facilitator and takes a leadership role in the classes and then works on the instructional mastery, only then the miracles happen. So Ms. Faiza, would you please uh, share your screen? Uh, I'm unable to do it. Uh, I think, let me try, yes, please. Sure. Give me a second, please. Let me try again. Can you hear me and see my screen clearly? I can hear you clearly, but I cannot see your screen at this moment. You are co-host and I think uh, you can go through sharing your screen. Yeah. Um, what about now? Can you see my screen now? Oh, yes. The beautiful brainy look on the screen. We all can see it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, okay, okay. Just let me... Oh, okay. Now, is it all right? This is just great, Ms. Faiza. We are all set. All right, okay. So, Hina, shall I start or do I wait for some time more? No, let's not wait. We have uh, 61 participants with us at this moment. We are expecting few more, but they are dropping in and they'll be able to access the recording. So I would request you to let's begin. All right. Okay. Okay. Ji, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much, Hina, for inviting me again on your platform. It's lovely to be here and uh, I am so honored to be here and deeply humbled. Thank you so much. So let's start with the name of Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrakhli sadri wa jassir li amri wa khlu luqtatam min lisani yafkahu kawli. Rabbi zidni ilma. So today's topic is the personalized learning paths for educators. And um, as Hina has already said my name, it's Faiza Sambal Hoda. And this is my humble profile, educational background is master's in economics, and then certified trainer by Cambridge University and Arizona State University, USA. Numerous certifications in English language and communication skills from all these institutes. Some are online and some have been face-to-face. -face. And my experience has been um, in the corporate sector as a consultant, counselor, and a trainer. And right now I'm working as a freelance soft skill and English language trainer. 
So let's dive into our topic, which is the concept of the personal learning path. Okay, so before I come to the basic concept, I would uh, like to my audience to participate that uh, if they can, uh, you know, want to share something or if they want to ask something, definitely they can just uh, put their question in the chat and I'm sure uh, the team would be, you know, come back to me with the questions and all that. So let's see what is the concept of basic learning path. It is basically a teaching ideology, a Finnish version of the concept of reversed or flipped learning. And it provides a theoretical framework for how each and every student is treated as an individual at a practical level, in spite of the fact that the classrooms are big and it has a lot of learners, like uh, slow learners, and we have fast learners, and we have intermediate learners. So in spite of all that, the personal learning path helps us to find a way to cater to all of them. And how, how do we do that? We get to learn that in the upcoming slides. I'm going to break down this concept into some steps. Number one, personalized learning is an educational approach or teaching ideology that aims to customize for each student's strengths, needs, skills, and interest. So that means that each individual, each student is, you know, prioritized and uh, an educator or a teacher focuses according to his or her needs or strengths and interests. Next, each student gets a learning path that's based on what they know and how they learn best. Now, this part is also very important, what they know and how they learn that some of the students are very good in writing but they're not good listeners. Some of them are good listeners, but they're not, not good writers. So this learning path or this learning way is for them who is a best listener or who's the best writer. So it is based on that. Last but not least, a classroom that doesn't have a one size fits all approach to education. This is the crux of the personal learning path. Or this is the core of this concept that education should be given in a way that it does not, one size does not fit all. It should be a personalized thing. So this is the basic concept of personal learning path it is divided or which is, you know, broadened into three steps. Moving on, I would like to share a video with all of you, which shows some of the challenges of the teacher. Definitely there are a number of challenges. I'm not going to count all of them and we are not going to talk about them because that is not our focus, but there's some of them. So let's see. And I would like you to take notes if you want to, but there are very good points and uh, we'll see this video. Okay, let me turn it on, please. Here's the challenge of teaching. You work hard to plan great lessons, but when you get to class, you realize some of your learners already know this. They're bored. Some of your learners have gaps in what they understand. They're lost. Some of your learners aren't in class at all. They miss out. And somehow, you've got to reach them all. You might feel overwhelmed. Meeting every learner's needs might feel impossible but it's not your fault. And it's not your learner's fault either. It's just that when it comes to learning, one size does not fit all. So what can you do? How can you teach in a way that meets every learner's needs? First, create short videos to explain your content. You're still the one teaching, but learners can watch your lessons anytime, anywhere. They can skip ahead or rewatch if they you can spend class time working one-on-one -on -one with learners or leading small groups. And learners who miss class can always catch up. Second, help learners pace themselves. Learners who are ready to go faster can move ahead as soon as they're ready. Learners who need more time have the time they need. Learners who miss a day can pick up right where they left off. 
and you're there to support and encourage each of them. Third, focus on mastery. When learners show they understand, they can move on. If they don't understand yet, help them, then give them another chance. This prevents learning gaps, and it shows learners that when a classroom really meets their needs, they can master anything. Teacher-created videos, self-pacing, and a focus on mastery. We call this a modern classroom. It's a model built by teachers for teachers. Research shows that in modern classrooms, learners feel more capable and engaged, while teachers feel happier and more effective. Modern classrooms are calmer, and everyone in them can thrive. Teaching this way takes practice, but there are free resources to help you get started and a global community of educators who can support you along the way. Remember, you're a teacher, you're up for the challenge, and you really can meet every student's needs. So what are you waiting for? Your journey to a modern classroom begins today. Okay, so I think this gives us a good picture of um, creating um, these all things in our teaching practices about creating video and um, help learners pace themselves and uh, focusing on the mastery. So let's move on and let's see what are the core uh, components of personalized learning. Um, number one is the student reflection and goal setting. The most important point is that we empower students through reflective practices, developing self-awareness, recognizing their strengths in trust and learning styles. This is so important point that when you empower students, their reflection, their thought process increases and they are, you know, they go into reflective thinking process, which helps them to grow as a person and in their learning things as well. The goal settings enable them to connect academic pursuits to their personal growth. So the education, the personal growth, and everything goes hand in hand. Second, targeted instructions. Now what happens in targeted instruction is that um, it helps educators to bridge the gap between the curriculum content and the individual student needs. That is, educators or teachers can design tailored instruction, you know, according to the student academic, which is aligned with their abilities and their challenges. As I said in the previous slide, some students are slow learners, some students are um, fast learners. So it can be designed according to their learning patterns. Moving on, collaboration and creativity. Now, this is an environment which is, you know, which progress, which gives strength to collaboration and creativity. And personalized learning thrives when there is an environment of collaboration and creativity. Students engage with peers and develop innovative solutions by exchanging ideas. Educators facilitate such environments where students' unique perspective contribute to good learning experiences. So both of them, the learners and educators, you know, they prosper in this kind of an environment. And it is such a positive environment. Last is the flexible path and pace. Now, flexibility is definitely very good. This allows a student or a learner to learn according to his or her own needs. And it gives the timeline as well to them, whether they can learn any time of their, you know, whatever the time is. This leads students autonomy as they make choices aligned with their interests and strengths. So these are the four core components of personalized learnings. Now, let's see how this model actually works. What happens? How can we use personalized learning 
in our uh, schools or in our places wherever we are teaching. As we know that no two individuals are similar and no two students are same. We all have different strengths. We all have different skills. We have all sets of problems. We all have different challenges. We all have different things in our life and so for the students as well. Similarly, no two schools are similar in their how they operate. But there are a number of ways the schools adopt this personal learning works in their schools. Let's see how they are done. Number one is schools that you the school keeps an up-to-date records of each student's individual strengths, needs, motivation, progress, and goals. Profiles are updated accordingly, and these detailed updates helps educators or teachers to make decisions to positively impact student learning. This is a very good concept that you work according to students' strengths and their needs. This is really good but it has to be updated all the time. That is, teachers or educators need to be on their toes all the time and keep that updated. Next, we come to schools that use personalized learning paths. Now, what do I mean by that? This is a customized learning that responds or adapts based on progress, motivation, and goals. Now I will be repeating this sentence. This is a customized learning process that responds and adapts according to the progress, motivation and goals of the learners. For instance, a school might create a student's schedule based on the weekly updates about academic progress and his interests. This might include project-based learning, with a small group of peers, independent work, like certain learning certain skills or complex tasks, or one-to-one -one tutoring with a teacher. Student works on different skills at different paces. Educators closely, closely monitor each student and provide wherever the support is required. Now this goes like this, that when the student requires more to work on, they are there to support it. When he or she needs little autonomy, they can give the autonomy to the student. Schools that use competency-based progression. Now this type of schools continue, um, it's based basically because they assess students to monitor their progress towards specific goals. This system makes it clear to students what they need to master. These competencies include specific skills, knowledge, um, and mindsets like developing resilience. So this is based on competencies, and these competencies can... Uh, change. If they have done one, they can move on to another competency. If the second is done, they can move on to third. There is no fail or pass in it. There are no examinations. And what happens is this is a continuous learning path. And the knowledge keeps on coming to the student and they keep on going as such in the classrooms. Next, we come to the last thing which is the schools using flexible learning environment. Now environment again comes to be a very important factor in any kind of a learning. We can see that in our daily life or in our experience, if we see that if we put a seed in the soil and uh, we do not give water to it, do not give sight to it, it not grow. We all know that it has to be given water it has to be given sunlight and it has to be given in short an environment where it grows. It comes a small plant, medium plant, big plant, and then a tree. So environment is extremely important, not only for plants, but definitely, definitely for human beings as well. So if you talk about the students, environment is extremely important for best learning. Now, what happens in this kind of model, in this kind of schools is the school adopts the environment students learn in, which is based on how they learn best. 
This includes things like the physical setup of the class, how the school day is structured, or how the teachers are allocated. It is definitely not easy for teachers to redesign their you know, space, time, and the resources. But uh, this type of design thinking can help students reshape the learning environment. So these are the four models through which personal learning works, how the personal learning works, and how the students can be you know, given their personal learning paths and how the schools can adapt any, you know, e any one of these uh, ways, whichever suits them. Moving on, now we will watch uh, personal learning, some insights of uh, why, how, and what this process takes place. Let's see this. Hello, and welcome to Teachings in Education, the personalized learning model. Question, why should we use a personalized learning model? Well, with a personalized learning model, students are actively learning. It's a student-centered classroom where students are busy working. Another benefit is that appropriate learning goals are given for each student. These appropriate goals will increase the chance of student success. Utilizing technology is a big part of personalized learning. Students will use technology and develop digital literacy through their personalized instruction. Here, students' interests are prioritized and integrated into their personal curriculum. This helps make the learning experience more meaningful for students and increases engagement. One of the biggest advantages is that students don't really fall behind. Students work at their optimal pace and aren't forced to keep up with other higher achieving students. Moving forward, we ask, how do you personalize learning? I'm going to outline my personal strategy, which is merely a guide for instruction. First off, you need to get to know the student. How can you personalize learning without knowing the student? Find out the student's interests, strengths, weaknesses, hobbies, life goals, etc., and so forth. The next step involves learning goals. Collaboratively work with your students and help them create learning objectives under your guidance. Next, co-design curriculum with students and incorporate project-based learning models. This can involve an inquiry-based learning strategy and longitudinal portfolios. Now, teachers have to give students the opportunity to work at their own pace. Students shouldn't feel rushed. It's important that they don't compete with other students. Number five, be a facilitator of learning. Ask probing questions to students and be there for your students at any obstacle. Lastly, assessments. Consider using standards-based grading, formative assessments, and self-assessments for students. Now, let's take a look at personalized learning from the learner's perspective. And it becomes much easier for the learner with recent advances in technology. Personalized learning model redefines the way we look at a student. The student is instead defined as a learner with the ability to create their own learning paths. Students slash learners discover and understand how they learn best. They recognize their strengths, weaknesses, and what they should do to succeed. With this model, teachers are viewed more as collaborators. Students should feel comfortable asking teachers for help and assistance. Too often, students become disengaged because they are being told how to learn, what to learn, and when to learn. Students have a level of control here. The learners are given a voice and flexibility. Personalized learning provides students with real power to make changes and take part in design of curriculum. 
Nevertheless, it's ultimately the teacher that must okay the curriculum created by the student. And lastly, we move on to the personalized learning environment. In the environment, there must be a place where a student can work one-on-one -on -one and get individual time with their teacher. There should also be a designated area for whole class discussions. Here, teachers can make announcements and allow students to bounce ideas off of one another. There should be a space for students to work on projects. Remember, project-based learning is a large component of personalized learning. A place for collaboration and group work should be created. Think of long tables, however, circular tables I recommend. And lastly, a place for students to work individually as necessary. There are going to be times when students need to work on their laptops. Right now, I want to say thank you for your time. Subscribe to this channel. And you'll also find links in the description below for resources, PowerPoint presentations, and much, much more. Thank you for your time. Okay. So we have learned so many things from, um, from this uh, personalized learning model. And I have deliberately stopped this uh, slide over here, which tells us why use personalized learning, how, and then the learner's point perspective and the environment. If uh, anybody wants to take a picture of this, uh, screenshot of this, you are most welcome to do it because it is a very comprehensive and it's a very concise and precise thing which we can you know, use in our practices as well. So let's move on. And now we come how we can design a customized learning path. Um, for our students in the classroom. Let's see, number one, develop personal learning goals. The educator and the learner work to develop short-term, intermediate and long-term personal learning goals. Now this point is very important because when we are designing or when we are planning, making our uh, work plans for the students, we usually what happens is the practice is, you know, one shoe fits all. You know, this is what we are focusing. But in the learning path, in the personalized learning path concept, we have to categorize things according to the students' needs and their skills and their demands. We have already discussed that. The next point is to decide about the goals or the thing which with which we have to take the learner in the short-term, intermediate, and long-term learning goals. What do they have to achieve? How do they have to achieve? And how do we have to, as an educator or a teacher, we have to take them? So it's very important to define that path or that road map from the short to the long-term personal learning goals of the student. Next. We select activities and resources to support learning. Now here, what, what happens is both educators and learners suggest activities and resources to use in meeting the students' personal learning goals. Now here, I would like you to focus on the word suggest both the educators and the learners. Now what happens in the normal classroom, it's the teacher who's decided, is deciding everything. But here, the educator and the learner, they both suggest activities and resources for the student's personal learning goals. How much a student is contributing to his own learning path. Educator present what they can offer, and that is the strategic instructional seminars, learning activities, and useful resources. And from the learner's or student's point of view, they can suggest what they might contribute to the plan that is collaborating with classmates on specific tasks, locating apps to support learning, their support learning. So this is a very important point that this is not a one-way game. This is from both the students and the teachers. Moving on. Identify progress markers. Now, when we 
go through a process, anybody is going through a process, we come to a point that we have to identify or we need to identify our progress that whatever we have learned, are we able to, you know, come up to that mark? And that is where we have to have certain markers. So the educator and learner identify markers that show progress towards meeting each learning goal of the student. Markers are based on formative assessment data and help the learner focus on the learning progress rather than simply what activities and tasks he or she is doing. So progress markers are also like for the educators and learners to determine whether the changes in the learning path may be necessary to ensure the accomplishment of each goal. So having markers is very important in order to learn whether they are going in the direction which is according to their strengths, according to their skills, according to their weaknesses, or whatever their goal is. Last, and that is define how the learning will be demonstrated. Now we come to a point when the student has learned everything or has learned in competency, where a point comes when he or she has to demonstrate. The final step in constructing customized learning path is defining how learning will be demonstrated. This is the place where he and she showcases their abilities or their things or their skills, what they have learned in the personalized learning path. And this is the point where they'll get to know what they wanted to accomplish. They have done that and they are showcasing their knowledge to the world, to the school and to their fellow peers. Next, we come to the learning paths for higher education students. Now, this learning, personalized learning paths is not only for young kids or for intermediate students. It can definitely be used for higher education students as well. Now, how do we do that? And what happens in it? There is an ownership of learning. Now, what, does, what do I mean by ownership of learning is that, that we take the full responsibility of our learning. What we are learning, how we are learning, why we are learning, we take the full responsibility of that. And I think this is like just for all of us, you know, we are doing so many online courses and all that. And during COVID days, we have all learned to move from face-to-face -face learning to online learning. We have all been doing number of online things and we take the full ownership of this learning concept. Then we have catering to different learning styles. We can, we can do that. We can cater to different learning styles. Then we have enhanced students' engagement. That when we are, you know, we are focusing, we are taking the full responsibility on our education system, on our, our education, we are more engaged. And that is the second point is self-paced learning. Now, why I went from one to four and then three and two? Because I wanted self-paced learning to come at the end, not in the end, let's say on the second last position, because all these help us in having self-paced learning and which eventually leads us to a better learning pattern. And we learn better in this way rather than you know listening to the lectures all the time. Lastly, we create personalized learning paths for higher education students through the learning paths definitely. And we can do this for any type of class, we can do for any level, we can do any any master's level or the higher levels as well. Moving on, I come to the benefits of the personalized learning paths. Number one is improved academic performance. When we are responsible for our own education, we are responsible for our own learning. We definitely work better and we have good academic scores. This goes for not for higher education. This goes for younger kids as well. This goes for intermediate students as well. Then we have built self-advocacy. We are better able to speak up for ourselves because we take the full responsibility of that. Then we have collaboration. 
in collaboration we learn a lot there's a, this is the this is the true place where we get to learn and develop soft skills and our personal bonding develops at this point when we are in a collaborative environment and when we are improving interaction with each other this is the bonding this is the place where bonding takes place and we can say and this is how we connect to each other then we have educators can use their class time more eff eff effectively sorry more effectively now this is for educators that when they are the teachers are working on the personalized learning parts they have they can use the class time more effectively because they can concentrate on the students who are weaker uh, apart from doing other work they can concentrate on that and they can give support to the students who lack certain knowledge or who require more time because the fast students or the fast learning students are already have already done their work so they can focus on these low learners and last but not least it develops reflective and critical thinking which is not helpful not in the student life but for overall life for the whole life having reflective and critical thinking thought process helps a lot to a person so by the end of uh, this uh, presentation the learning outcomes which we have with us is that personalized learning paths are custom made roadmap for learning for all types of learners i have highlighted and put this word in bold and underlined it because this goes for all types of learners this is helpful for all of them slow medium or fast learners or any type of other learners and lastly personalized learning can help to reduce the stigma of special education now, now this is a very important point and anybody who can you know who has taught special kids or who has special kids can know the stigma of special education if we have the personalized learning paths in our schools this stigma can definitely you know we can get rid of that so with this i end today's presentation uh, thank you so much and i would welcome if you have any question or answers and um, this is my linkedin and this is my email if anybody wants to get connected to me i would welcome that so the stage is all yours um, hina thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge with your audience thank you so much thank you very much faiza it was an enlightening session for all of us specifically the way you came up with the points and then the stigma of special education which was a very solid and need based point in this current era where we are surviving um on the whole this complete talk really was a paradigm shift for many of the teachers who joined us today so thank you very much for being there and please be in the acceptance of my warmest appreciation as always uh, one question which came across and uh, i i would like you to answer this in case if you can how can i promote mm -hmm. personalized learning among my learners for a longer time well for that i think um i personally think that first of all the teachers need to be trained properly need to have a training but how to take that for a longer run and <clears throat> it's basically not in one class it's the school which has to do that it is a school point of at the level at that level i think and when the school is promoting that that you can definitely take it in the for the longer run i mean this is this kind of thing is not for shorter time of period we cannot have that this is always for a longer run thing and uh, i personally think that schools need to adopt that then things can take them can be taken to a longer run otherwise it is difficult for an individual person to work for a you know for a single classroom it is difficult for a single person i mean this is what i think but i would welcome any other person who would like to say anything any other point of view 
No other point of view over this. And thank you very much for such valid and solid answer, Ms. Farza. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so the insights we have learned today here on the screen, let's take them away and let's infuse these in the classrooms wherever we work as teachers. I am sure these paradigm shifting points are going to be very helpful for our students when they'll be heralds of future that change which we want to see them right away starts from now, from this moment. So thank you very much, Ms. Faiza, for being with us today. And uh, we, inshallah, will keep collaborating with you in future. Thank you so much, Hina. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to it, to come back to your platform again and again. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was really an honor to be with you. It's like always learning together with my trainees and we will learn and we grow together. Thank you very much. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to take a stretch, you can stretch yourselves. But let me tell you, the next session is going to be very interesting. This is all about integrating data-driven decision-making in educational leadership, which is, again, a very latest, a new trending topic. And our presenter for this, Mr. M. Kamran, has really been looking into it in, in you know, a lot of depth and uh, detail. Before she begins, let me tell you about Ms. Hiram. Ms. Hiram Kamran is an educationist with working experience of two decades. She is a Cambridge certified teacher trainer, a PTCC graduate who's currently serving as director of training and development at Orchard Grammar School. She is the founder and director of an online training organization, which is named as Turning Point Training and Consultancy. And I'm sure many of you know her very well already. She is a certified hypnosis instructor and master life coach from the First Institute of Dynamic Learning US. She has earned the train the trainer certification from Teachers Development Center, Torque and Possibilities, and she's a licensed NLP practitioner. Thank you very much, Ms. Hiram, for joining us. And I'm glad you were with us during Ms. Faiza's session as well. Assalamu alaikum, Hina. How are you doing? I am all good. Rather very happy and excited to have you with us as a presenter today. Thank you. It's lovely being here. And I'm really thank you, uh, thankful to you for inviting me. And inshallah, the participants would find this session worth attending. For sure. I guarantee this. Yeah. So should we wait five minutes more? In case if participants feel like having a stretch break. So they can give us a thumbs up if they wish to start right away. They can give a thumbs up. And if they want a break of five minutes, they can give a thumbs down. So let's see what they have to say. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thumbs up pouring down. Just one wants to start right away. May wish also, all right. Just give me a minute. So let's begin. All right. So if many of you are willing, give me a minute to share my presentation and then we'll start. Yeah, sure. Please take your time. So officially, assalamu alaikum, everybody. I hope I am audible and visible to all of you. Thank you so much again, Hina, for having me here today. And inshallah, I'll share as much as I have explored on this, uh, as you said, the latest modern approach, but very widely being used in businesses, corporate sectors, educational industry, software industry, and at a personal level as well. So we'll see the things mostly in the educational context, since many of you must be educationists here. But wherever I'll find relevant examples, I'll quote from the daily life also, so that you have a better understanding and a wider perspective of integrating data-driven decision-making in our daily lives, in educational leadership, wherever you feel like applying it. All right, so I would skip the profile part since it has already shared, but let me, yes, I think this is all already done. So 
I am running my online training platform for the development of women. And the focus over there is the personal and professional development. So we offer different training programs. And all right. I have to reshare my laptop is not in a mood to start. Let me reshare. I hope it's visible to all of you. Now it's fixed. It's visible. Working perfect. Yeah. yeah. It was not going ahead previously. All right. So it's very important for you to know that where you are going to invest you another 50 minutes because I got to know that I have to uh, stretch the content to another 50 minutes. So we are going to cover certain things in today's session. You should be having a, a certain idea about that. What is data? We'll open layer by layer of the whole approach. So we'll start from what is data, then what is decision making. Then we're going to put it together to see what is data-driven decision-making, especially in the context of education sector and how you can use it. Benefits of DDDM. So let me share here in the presentation, Many at many points, we will find written DDDM or D3M. So when we shorten it, we say it, pronounce it like this or write it like this. So you have an understanding about that. Steps of DDDM. There are certain steps that you can follow in order to apply this in your uh, context, in your situation, in your scenario. Challenges of D3M, whenever we talk about any approach, always keep that in mind. There is always a darker side. There is always a challenge, a risk, or certain challenges or risk involved. So, you know, if we adapt any of the approach, keeping in mind the challenges and risks involved, it keeps us on the safer side. And we become more aware and we prepare beforehand to come across any kind of you know, uncertainties while adapting or applying any new or modern technology or approach. Best practices to integrate D3M in education. Towards the end, we'll focus more on the how part of the, of the approach. There are a few best practices which are uh, uh, I have shortlisted out of many which will be uh, applicable for you, you would be able to apply them right after this session. And inshallah, I'll be giving some time in uh, exploring two or three maybe digital tools where I'll be showing you the dashboards of how some software or some digital tools which are commonly used by us in everyday life, but we miss on the data-driven decision-making part that can be uh, those tools used for. So inshallah, we'll be focusing and looking at the at those parts of those uh, those aspects of those uh, digital tools today in the end, towards the end. So let's do an activity. Let's start the session by doing an activity. I'll uh, make you do something. So I'm sharing a form link with you. It's a very simple form and it's very easy, short. You just have to fill it and then we'll use it towards the end of the session. So let me share the link with you all here. I'll be sharing it in the chat box. And once you get it, you're going to let me know that you've got it. It's very simple form. It's there in your chat box. Please check and if you can access it, give me a thumbs up so that I know you all have got it. Anyone who is able to access, thank you, I got you. And let me see when I get a response on it. It's basic information that I need to know before starting the session. And later on, I'll let you know the other use of it. Thank you. Most of you are showing the thumbs up. You've got it. All right. Let me see if I've got any response out of it. I've got one. So you can continue filling the form and I'll go ahead with another slide.
Yes, you should click on it right now, Nadeem, because I need some responses that I'll be using towards the end of the session to explain you something. So let me share the link with you again if uh, may, some of you have joined the session right now. So I'm sharing it again and let me share it with Hina also so that she can forward it to any of you. And you people can fill it up. All right. So after that, we'll be moving ahead. Hina, I have shared the form link with you. You can share if uh, again in the chat if any of the participant joins late. So well, let's go back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So it's a very short form. You can you people can fill it up and then let's move. We'll discuss it later, okay? So first, let us explore what is data. So what is your uh, understanding about data? It's the most commonly word we have been using since the evolution of computers. So what do we understand about data? It's not only related to computers, but it's everywhere. It's raw information. I would not say raw, but yes, it's information. Collection of information, yes, good. Information again, okay. Think a little bit more about it. Yes, it's true that it's information. We are just talking about data only, okay. Information, community-based, complete form of information. So form is a source of collecting information, right? It's a, it's a tool that we are using. We can use templates to collect information. We use surveys to collect information. We use different types of forms to do to collect information. Unprocessed information. All right. Great. So let's see what is basically data. Data is concrete information. It is fact. It is figures, numbers, evidences, or other useful information. Something that is, you know, we can depend on, something that we can use, something that we can utilize to take, uh, to, you know, further utilize it in some, in some work or in doing some uh, research or anything. So data is nothing, just useful information. And it can be in any form. It can be facts. It can be numbers. It can be any quantity. It can be some testimonials, it can be some evidences, anything that provides us some information about something is data for us, right? What is decision making? So I would like to know that how do you people uh, decide to buy a phone? Before we going into the decision making, I would like to ask you people, how do you people decide to buy a phone? I made a slide for that, I think the order, yes. This is a chat box activity. How do you decide to buy a mobile phone? So I am giving you three options here. Ask a friend or a colleague who's using the same model. This is option number A. There could be other options also, but for right now, you have to pick amongst these three. Number B, visit the website or read reviews. For example, you are about to buy a certain model of a mobile and you want to know about it. So would you visit the website and read the reviews over it or find out what people say about it online? Option C, prefer visiting to the shop and buy it if you like it. On spot, if you feel like buying it, if you get the intuition, so you're going to buy it. If you don't feel like, you're not going to buy it. So let me see what options have you people selected. A and B too, okay. Option B, option B, option C. All right, some of you are preferring visiting the shop and if you feel like you're going to make the decision over there. Some of you wish to visit the website and read some reviews. So nobody's trusting their friends here. Nobody's asking a friend or colleague who's already using the same model that you wish to buy. I can't see any A's here, perfect. Initially, somebody said A, but mostly it's, you know, Sana said A. Okay, trusting issues. I know. So, this is how we make different issues. Okay. So, let's move to decision making now. What is decision making? So, now we know 
that decision making is an important soft skill that means taking action to achieve something using intuition or useful information when we decide to do something when we uh, make a plan in our mind when we take some action to achieve certain task desire this is called decision making and decision making is a softer skill and many of us want to work on it some people say that i don't have you know good decision making skills i lack in decision making skills i have very strong decision making skills i always take decisions like this so you know there are two ways of making decisions sometimes we make decisions depending on our intuition or our gut there's a gut feeling someone says like you know i have a gut feeling i i should go for this i have a gut feeling you know i should not do this this doesn't sound good to me or this this is not giving me positive vibes sometimes we we take decisions like this but when it comes to businesses when it comes to you know running organizations when it comes to involving you know certain clientele to satisfy like in education sector we take parents as our clients children as our product so you know we have to work on them and there is some marketing also involved because schools are also run uh, run as organizations as businesses profit loss involved something becomes business right so there you can not only depend on your intuition there you need to have some useful information in order to take informed decisions in order to take strategic decisions in order to take those decisions which enhance your productivity take your organization to the next level benefit the employees that are teachers other stakeholders decision making mean, means to make the right choice to get any desired result so if you have a number of choices you should be able to take a decision and there are two ways as i have shared already depending on your intuition or using some yes useful data that is um, that could be any research market research that can be any survey with the parents that can be anything that is provided to you or you collect it yourself for example i had to come here for this session so this is a, a new platform for me i have never done any session from this platform but i asked the organizer ms hina for certain information that you know who's going to be the audience uh, what are their backgrounds like their teachers or you know owners school owners or educational leaders how much is going to be the time for the session so how much should i plan so this all was data for me i was trying to collect data from the organizer in order to reach to my desired goal or my desired result that was to conduct a session on so and so topic so this is all the research that i could do and this is all the information or data that i could collect in order to help my decisions right so this is what we have already done so now comes data driven decision making ddm right so now you know data what is data now you know what is decision making so putting them together becomes an approach that is data driven decision making as i have shared already this is the most commonly used approach in the businesses in the corporate sector in the software industry in the educational sector and at a personal level also you can use this so it is the process of using data to inform and improve practices and outcomes whenever you want to take some decision in order to take the organization to improve the organization to improve the system you need to consider certain data which maybe you can collect or which be which, which maybe you can ask somebody else to provide you in education it involves collecting analyzing interpreting various types of data let me share here with you there are different types of data also but we are not going to go into a lot of detail those of you who are interested you can search the certain type of data that can be collected in order to take decisions such as student performance as teachers you uh, teachers um, you people maintain the students performance records you make uh, your observation uh, do the observations you have the behavior or the attendance uh, record or to track their behavior and attendance there are certain rubrics that you follow engagement feedback and satisfaction right so these are all the areas which an educationist being a leader or a teacher works on and there are certain other areas also 
So what are the benefits of DDDM? So let's go into, once you know what is DDDM, now let's dig deeper into the benefits of it. So there are many benefits of it out of those. The first one is reduced cost. So when we take informed decisions, when we are very sure and we are very confident having the logistics in hand, having the statistics in hand, having certain accurate and authentic data and updated data also. So we, you know, we take informed decisions and this saves our cost. This is a one-time cost that we have the system, we, we train people, and now the, you know, uh, decision-making, uh, data-driven decision-making is going on in the organization. That is a one-time cost. But once the system is established, you start saving your cost because instead of that, if you take decisions on your intuition, you may face failure, your decisions may not work, your decisions may not help you reach your desired results. Whatever targets you have set for your organization, you may not be able to meet them if you make decisions using your intuition or gut or just, you know, an abstract decision that I feel like doing that. So businesses cannot be run in the long term like this. Sometimes they may work, but sometimes they don't. So it reduces the cost of the loss that you may have faced making decisions on, you know, intuition or having just a gut feeling. Then we have increased speed. So whenever the system is established, whenever we're having a culture of uh, data-driven decision-making and the organization and everybody is following it, we save time and we increase the speed of work. Whatever work we are doing, we can save a lot of time on it. For example, teachers spend a lot of time in... Um, in making reports like uh, I have seen many schools have changed and updated and they are now using softwares to um, you know generate automated results but still many of the schools need to do that and they don't have um, maybe they have an IT department working on it but all the teachers are not trained to use those softwares and they are still making reports with hands manually and this takes a lot of time compilation of results takes a lot of time and this is a task which can be avoided which can be delegated to the software which can save our time and which can enable the teacher or the educationist to to pay attention to certain other areas which are of more importance to her right so it benefits us by increasing the speed and saving our time continuous improvement so when we are running an organization and when we are teaching students when we are, um, you know, building an image as an organization, as a good school, we need to show continuous improvement. And also to support our country, to support the education system, we need to establish a system, an educational system in our school, which is, you know, helping our generation to improve to become, uh, you know, a functional human beings, to add value to the society. But if we are not doing all that, so, you know, we are not improving the system. We are just, uh, you know, uh, passing students from one grade to another. We're just moving them ahead. But we are not developing the skills. We are not improving the results. We are not preparing them the, for the world. So there are certain objectives that an organization sets in mind and the teacher also has her own objectives according to the standards and the grade levels that ensure continuous improvement. So data-driven decision-making supports continuous improvement. It helps it and it supports continuous improvement. It improves children performance. It improves children learning. It helps improve the curriculum. It helps teachers plan better lesson plans. So this is all what is the benefit of DDDM. Collaborative decisions. When we talk about organizations, we need to collaborate between teams. We have certain teams, we have a big structure of an organization, of a school. So we need to collaborate. We need, we have different departments. We need to work interlinked and we have uh, you know, certain tasks which we need to do together. 
So different teachers need to work together. This involves more of the research, subject expert works to work together. So when we have data and that data supports us, it becomes easier for the teachers to produce better lesson plans. It becomes easier for the teacher and the IT department to work together on the same software that the school is having. And they all save time. They all save the cost and they achieve more in less time and they have the energy to do the other work, plan activities, uh, you know, look after their own well-being. So things become simpler. Complex things become simpler. And it, of course, supports the decisions that need to be taken. It also uh, makes communication easier. It also, when we represent data in the form of graphical, you know, uh, in the form of uh, visually attractive um, things like data, graphs, pie charts, donor charts. So, you know, things become easily understandable. Like I have used a slide over here, you can see. It is all data for you. There is a picture, there is some words. So, you know, it. I could have written a lot on the slides, but, you know, giving you uh, the information that is going to stay in your mind, I have used certain data. So, it's going to stay in your mind for a longer period of time. The last benefit of that, that I have written here, though there are many, is planning. So the planning becomes better whenever a teacher has a lesson plan. And at the end of the lesson, she gets to know through some data, a survey, an exit slip that she has circulated with the children, that how many children understand the lesson better? How much of the percentage in my class is clear with this particular concept. So do I need to go back for the reinforcement for clarifying their concepts or do I need to move forward with an activity to reinforce or maybe to assess? So all the surveys that we can do with the children, the quizzes, the formative assessments, the exit slips, any form of information that is telling us where our students are standing, what do they understand? And it specifies also, we'll see in the last through those two dashboards. We can also track the areas of improvement where the students are lacking or they are finding it difficult without asking them, without mentioning it, without making it very obvious for the students, without highlighting in, in front of the child that he or she is having some problem over there. We'll see to it in the last. So this is how data-driven decision-making improves planning of a teacher. Once she has the data and she knows how to utilize the data in a proper way, she would be able to plan better lessons. She would be able to improvise her work. She would be able to cater to the needs of those students who require some attention or improve certain areas of learning. So the five essential steps. There are certain steps that we need to follow in order to apply data-driven decision-making. We could have made decisions depending on our intuition or gut, but we are now trying to think data-driven decision-making to apply data-driven decision-making, right? So at the first place, we need, step number one, we need to figure out what the actual problem is, what the issue is. So whatever decision we need to make, we need to have certain problem. We need to address certain issue. For example, we need to plan a field trip. Uh, that is the issue. That is the things to be sorted. And that is the decision to be made. But we need to identify what exactly to be done. For example, I was invited here to deliver a talk or a session. So that was the decision. But I had to you know, identified that this is the thing that I want to work on. This is the problem. This is the issue I have to address. And then I started working on it. In the next step, strategize and identify the goals. Now make it specific. You found a problem. You found an issue to work on. You found something that you want to do or decide about. The second step is strategize and identify goals. Now you need to have smart goals. You need to specify what exactly needs to be achieved, what exactly you all must be knowing smart goals. I'm not going into detail of it. So we all know what are smart goals. 
and those goals um, how much time do they need to achieve and how much uh, what needs to be achieved is it measurable or not measurable so whatever is there we need to have specific goals of the problem of the issue of the decision that we want to take step number 3 target the data i was invited here i had certain goals in mind because i was given the topic i knew the time and i knew how much i have to achieve in a given certain um, uh, amount of time then i had to target data how can i get that data who is the right person to get that data so the organizer ms hena was the right person to get some information about the audience the second thing that i did i explored on the internet that you know who is the uh, right person to benefit or which kind of organizations get benefit from data de de driven decision making so i found that education sector is involving a lot of it and they're benefiting from it and the third thing i did was i got data from you people in the beginning of the session we look into that data also but the form link that i just shared with you only got data to me only got some information to me we'll see how to use that information step 4 collect and analyze data so once you collect and analyze data you know how to get it you know where to get it from what kind of data you required since i shared with you there are few types of data so collect and analyze data many times we have seen in our schools that at the in the ptms when we have conferences we get to fill a feedback form sometimes it's very complex sometimes it's very simple sometimes it has mcq some choices sometimes it has a grade which which gives us uh, the uh, the stages like you know meeting expectations need to improve or whatever so what i have seen because i have been working with different schools very closely and i have uh, i get to meet new teachers every other day so i have seen that the data that has been collected is not processed is never utilized is not worked upon because collection is one stage which is done but once you want to use it for the decision making to improve the system to make better choices you need to process it you need to study it you need to analyze it you need to delegate this task to any member of the team or a department few schools have quality enhancement cells these days i am glad to share that many schools have uh, i would say few schools have qec department that is the quality enhancement cell and that department works on the quality assurance and that department of course make observations collect some data and you know they process it they work on it and they suggest improvement in the system and you know uh, certain steps are to be taken so important is that whatever data the teacher is collecting the feedback from parents has been collected it needs to be worked upon step number 5 is make decisions regarding the findings once you have the findings once you know that you know this percentage of the total class is you know progressing in this way this percentage of the total class is doing this so then you are able to take decisions if you all remember previously uh, i think 10 years back or maybe more we used to have a ranking system and a child used to be you know uh, evaluated at uh, on the whole like english urdu math science whatever basic subjects they used to study and they used to have a basic grade telling us that the child is doing a plus or you know b or we used to label it but then awareness came evolved and we got to understand that we need to see specific areas if a child is doing good in math it's not necessary that he is also doing good in english so once we have separate data of the two subjects and we compare that data we analyze it and we see what has uh, you know been uh, shown by the data we would be able to improve that area of learning of the child so now we know that one child who is drastically doing good in english is not very good in social sciences so this is one of the benefit that we got from the data driven decision making but it's done at the very top level of the organization teachers sometimes they collect data but they not really process it 
So as I shared with you, there are a few challenges associated with DDDM. So the data has to be there. The first thing is the data has to be there. Many schools still do not have proper data or they have manual data. They do not have come, uh, uh, you know, uh, digital systems. So we need to have data first and that data has to be reliable and accurate. So if it is not reliable and accurate, the decisions we are going to make are not going to be benefiting the organization for which we have taken the decision. The data has to be updated and valid. If it is not updated and valid, it's some you know old statistics that we have uh, been provided or we have gathered ourselves. It's not going to help our decisions. We are going to take wrong decisions basic, uh, depending upon that data. Personal information is not secure. If the organization is collecting data from parents or the teachers are collecting some you know, personal information from children and they're not securing it, so that is also a risk that the, the approach can bring to you. Human error. This is something which needs to be uh, considered while applying this approach because at some point of time, the data needs to be humanly entered. The data needs to be input. Um, whatever softwares, modern or advanced softwares we use, at some point in the beginning, we need to give the, uh, the system, the software, some basic data manually, right? And then the system processes it, the system formulates it into percentages or graphically shows the, the further processes, whatever the, the results are generated out of it, the percentages that we get, the statistics that we get. So human error needs to be avoided, though it's going to be there 99%. But you know, uh, one percent. But we can avoid the ninety-nine percent ten percent through training and development. Recognizing diversity of learners and context. If we take informed decisions depending upon data, at some point of time, the systems are going to produce auto-generated results. So at that point, we need to have a human insight also, where we have to recognize the diversity of learners and the context that the system is applied to. So there are many benefits, many uh, significances or advantages of TDDM, but there has to be some, uh, you know, a uh, few points of consideration which need to be uh, kept in mind. So it's 7.30 right now. So next we have, I am sure I am very clear till here. If that is the case, let me know with a thumbs up because I have been constantly speaking for half an hour. So I need to know if I'm making sense here. Good. Thank you. All right. Great. Lovely audience. So best practices to integrate D3M in schools. So there are many tips to do that. There are many answers to this how question, but I would share only four points with you, which are the most important, right? Establishing a data-driven culture. What does it mean? It means an organization requires to, you know, equally, it requires equal contribution from every employee to practice this approach. It has to be a culture. The IT department is also following this. They are collecting, they're analyzing data, and they are producing, you know, some some statistics based on it to the management. The teachers also do the same. The management also is in a habit of making decisions. What if the IT department is producing the the statistics and it's not being utilized by the top management? So everyone in the organization in the school has to have this approach very clear in mind and they need to adapt it. So then it's going to be a collective culture and it's going to support it. Then we have training and education. How are we going to have that culture when we, have, we are on the same page? And all teachers need training and education in data concepts, visualization, communication and analysis how to collect data, 
how to graphically represent it, how to use the softwares, how to, you know, frame the right cost questions or the surveys or the MCQs or the quizzes or the right kind of um, assessments that bring us to the right conclusion. Many a times the assessments that we, we uh, design for the students don't take us to the right conclusions, don't specify the areas of improvement, which is the basic purpose of assessment. What is the purpose of assessment? The basic purpose of taking assessments is to, you know, highlight the area of improvement of the student so that we can work on, on them without embarrassing the student, without, you know, uh, making him feel bad. So the formative assessments, if they're not serving this purpose, there is no point of having them. The teachers and everyone in the school should be getting training on using digital tools, the softwares, the platforms that help them and make their work easy, the communication and the analysis. Again, how to utilize that data. They need to be engaged in developing digital skills to gain maximum benefit from D3M approach. So they need to be engaged at an organizational level where the organization is supporting their training and education. And if that, that is not happening, teachers should take their own charge and they should be able to support or, you know, they should be able to invest in their own training and development. So that in the classroom, whatever decisions they are taking, they are, are data driven. So another point, collaborative decision making. We discussed it earlier also as a benefit. It increases engagement by involving different teams, stakeholders, subject matter experts, helps get widened perspectives and newer insights and encourage diverse thinking. When we work together and we work on, you know, accurate data, supportive data that is going to help us taking informed decisions, we are going to be better researchers. We are going to be sharing better. We are going to collaborate well to improve the uh, performance of our learners. It also brings along more technical ideas. It supports innovation, different domains of expertise, promotes teamwork and increases the outcome. Basically, we need to increase the outcome of the organization. We need to achieve those goals. Why are we making all this effort? We need to grow the organization, achieve certain goals, benefit the learners. So this is all a teamwork. No single person or one department can do it all. Everybody has to contribute. Number four, explore digital tools or platforms. There are certain tools which enable educationists to create interactive dashboards, reports, data visualizations for better data exploration and decision making. Decision making becomes very easy once you have the accurate data. Once you have the organized, valid, updated data in front of you, you can take decisions, you can see the comparisons, you can see the growth, you can monitor the progress, and you can see what needs to be done, which area to be worked on. It becomes very simpler for any uh, stakeholder to take the decision. So explore different platforms what i have brought here i'll be sharing few platforms with you that will enable you we are going to look into them very briefly and later on you can explore them in detail on your own because we'll be managing the time also data management platforms are called dmp and this is also a very important thing to for the educationists to be aware of a data management platform dmp is an integrated digital tool or platform that allows organizations or businesses to collect, manage, and analyze data for business intelligence BI purposes. These days, you must have heard about EI, AI. Now it's BI, business intelligence, and Power BI, the software also. So that makes things complex, things very simpler and saves time. So I have uh, written two examples here. One is one example of DMP, data management platform, is the learning management system. Do you people know what is LMS or learning management system? Anyone who can use the uh, chat box to let me know. 
what do you understand by LMS or learning management system? We all have been using it during the COVID. So let's see how many of you are aware of it. Thank you, Noor Muhammad, for sharing a positive feedback. Many of you. System of delivery. Thank you. All right. So let me share here. Learning management system is LMS, and LMS is a system which supports the learning, which manages the learning. It is uh, an online virtual software where we can uh, upload homeworks, we can upload lessons, we can upload materials. Now you're going to get me better. You can upload your lessons over there. You can upload the assignments. You can take the assessments online. You can upload the reports of the children and, and you can uh, post any circulars. So a system that gives you the options to do features, to do all these things is called an LMS. So do you now get a very common example of LMS? Um, it's not only to put in data number, it's there to manage the learning of children. Yes, so the most common example of an LMS is Google Classroom. You all must have used Google Classroom. Have you people used Google Classroom? We all have done it during the COVID. There you have a class. There you can upload your materials, lessons in the form of videos or quizzes or anything uh, or open-ended questions. Variety of activities can be done in the real time at the pace of the learners. And then you can post the assignments which students can do at their own uh, pace also or they can do live participation also. Then after the assess assignments, you can assess them also. You can uh, post their, you know, numbered quizzes which can give you proper scores and then you can uh, post the reports of the children and they can see how well they are doing. You can monitor progress over there. So LMS can be it can be customized. It can be uh, the school's own portal. Many schools during the COVID, they, you know, uh, designed their own portals. That is a wonderful thing. Enterprise resource planning system, the ERP. ERP is another example of data management platform, DMP. ERP is a more advanced, a huge software, which looks into further huge departments of an organization. And it's a very complex um, software also. So it covers a lot of other departments like production, management, marketing, human resource, HR, so finance. So a lot of broader uh, terms or departments come into this. Here I have an example for you, uh, for teachers. So these are two pictures which you can see. These are the digital resumes you can say. You can also call them infographics. So what is shown here? This is all data about a teacher. In older times, we used to have those boring and less colorful uh, CVs or resumes. But now we have this digital infographic, which is telling all about the employee to the employer in less time. It is, you know, explaining everything. And this all information about the applicant is data. Either it's in the form of the words or the icons. It's represented in a way, organized in a way that would be able or help the employer to take informed, strategic, and a better decision about hiring the person. So let me stop share here and let me go to the form that we just filled. We all are aware of the use of Google form, right? So we've got 50 responses here. Let's quickly look into this. This is a very simple form of data collection, which I'm showing here. But let me point out the informed decisions that I'm going to, I had made when I started the session. So in the beginning of the session, I shared this form with you, which is a very simple Google form. We all use it every day. We all uh, buy online things and we fill the forms over there also. So when I asked you to fill this form in the beginning of the session, though I had certain data collected through the organizer and I had used it already taking decisions on how much to plan, what to plan and you know what to include and what to not. 
but this form helped me in the beginning to know that there are how many males and females so you can see that 62.2 percent 67.2 uh, percent are female and the rest are male here then the cities are here this is I, if I want to use it, I can use it for giving relevant examples. This is very important. So 29.3% are secondary teachers here. And the software that I'm going to share after this is going to help you people. 17 teachers make it 29.3% of the total strength that we have right now. And there are other people from other fields also. Name of the school is not that I'm looking into right now. Are you familiar with data-driven decision-making? So 51 people, when they came to the session, they said that they are not aware of data-driven uh, decision-making and 48% were aware, which makes 28, per, 28 people were aware and 30 people were not aware and many of you did not reply. Rate yourself on your level of digital expertise. This is the question which I asked so that I know how much should I, you know, go into uh, depth of the digital tools. So 3% said that there are 19, 32% uh, said that they are, you know, uh, an average at an average level. 5%, sorry, 4 people, 6.9% are expert level and 9 people, 15.5% are at a beginner level. So we have all kinds of learners here. So this was a basic form which I just made you fill in order to show you that what data to be collected and how can we use it to take decisions. Now I am left with six more minutes. Let me give you an overview of the software Nearpod. Many of you must have shared this, uh, used this already. Have you used Nearpod already? Give me a thumbs up if you have or you can write yes or no in the chat. Okay, so let me share the screen again. Nearport is a very common lesson planning software. During the COVID, you must have used it. So I am not going to teach you the software here, but I'm going to, I'm going to take you to the left side of left panel of the interface where it shows my lessons, my profile and reports. So we'll go into the reports quickly to show you I am sure you can see my screen. Hina, is my screen visible clearly to everybody? Yes, sir, this is visible. All right, thank you. So there are many lessons here, but this is the report section, right? So I'm here in the report section. I have been conducting different lessons over here. So I have got the reports, the auto-generated reports, whether I need them or not. The software is designed like this. So the reports are already there. So I would show you one of them which was uh, used many times. So we'll pick the first one where there were eight students and it was attempted by eight students. But let me see, did everybody 100% uh, participated in it? So this is now the you know progress of the class where four activities were there in the lesson, eight students did it and it was a, a live participation, activity reports and student reports. And this is the general summary. So the general summary, summary tells me the names of the students, right? And total participation was 88% out of the class. Quiz was 95% and three activities were there. So it's telling me the percentage of every activity. Activity reports, if we go into the second tab, we get to know that which activity was there and we can see the details also. Once we move ahead with different activities, the second was the quiz. So average score was 95%, which is good. And 88% was the participation. And these are the scores of individual students, right? Then we have student reports. I'm going a little quick now. Students reports, we have 100%. So we can go according to the name of the student. I You can see the tab here where the students' names are changing. So I'll go to Farah Shoaib, who attempted this lesson. And let me download this report of Farah Shweb. There's a download tab here. You, It's going to ask for an entire lesson or student report. I would go into a student report. I'll select Farah Shweb from here. It's going to ask me for a PDF and I'll download in the local drive, right? So once the report is downloaded, 
I can show you what specific areas the report is highlighting. All right, so I'm sure you can see the report also. This is providing me data about Farah Shwe. She attempted every question, 100% participation, but the overall class participation you can see was 88%. Every child did not attempt everything. Quizzes, 100%, overall class, 83%. Now, if I need to see what, how many questions were correct, you can see that it is giving me the correct questions. It is giving me what was the performance in open-ended and collaborative board. I can also download this, um, this report and I can also print it. Now, I'll be moving to another software, which is quizzes. We all have been using it. This is the interface, the homepage of the quizzes. You all can see that on the left-hand panel, again, there is a section of reports, right? So once you go into reports, you'll find all the reports that are here, whether you need it or not, right? So this is something which I have uh, done at different times with the students. So I'll take this mental math lesson and let's see what details or what data this software is providing me to better decide about this specific class with which I had delivered this lesson. So accuracy of the class was 89%, completion rate was 91%, total students were 10 and questions were 8, right? So there are three tabs, participation. If I need to see the participation, see how beautifully, visually attractive data is provided being here. Now it's me who should know how to use it, how to read it, how to utilize it for my improvement, for my improved decisions, right? For improving the uh, performance of my students. Then the second tab takes us to questions. So, you know, these are the correct questions, incorrect questions. Every question has a specific data detail for us. Overview. Overview of the questions, which can help us a lot. This software is giving us a lot of detail. This was a fun quiz. Children were playing it like a game, but I have a lot of information. There is a tab of live dashboard on the top right. If you click on it, you get to see the live dashboard that happened that day. There you get to see the winners. You can show all this to your management to better explain them how good you are doing, what is your performance, and you know how you can further take it to the next level. So once we skip it, we can see Again, class accuracy is here. This is really attractive for us. Let me stop the music here. All right. So this is, you can review the questions. This is the leaderboard that we have got here. Every student's progress is also here. We can see the wrong answers that have been attempted. The best thing that I like about this software or the dashboard is, it shows us the time taken by every student for doing a particular question like if we read it like this that how much time was uh, drawn by a particular question so we can see that question number six has taken the maximum time of 17 seconds and that was taken by one of the student so now if i'm a good teacher if i'm a reflective teacher and if i understand the approach of data driven decision making I'll go back to the student and I'll check with her about her uh, concept of question number six. Or maybe I'll explain it again without discussing anything or making her embarrassed, right? So this is giving us very specific data, very detailed data, which if we make use of, we can do wonders with it. So I'm going to stop share here and I'm going to go back to my presentation to conclude the session for today. And I think I'll conclude at uh, 7.55. I'll take these five minutes. Please, All right. No worries. Yeah. So the next thing that I have here is whatever I could have shared. This is uh, the barcode. If you scan it right now, if you have um, uh, barcode scanners in your mobile, you can uh, scan it and you will get my digital business card. Meanwhile, we'll be concluding by recalling whatever we discussed. We discussed started from what is data, what is decision making, what is putting them together, data-driven decision making, what is the 
uh, benefit of it, what are the benefits of it, what are the challenges associated, and how to in integrate, how to apply them, and how uh, to use the digital softwares available. So once you scan the barcode, you'll get my contact details and we can stay connected. Thank you so much, Ms. Hena, for having me here. It was lovely um, doing this session and I hope we are going to meet again. Thank you, everyone. I couldn't read your chat, but I'll read it right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Hena, for being here with us on the screen. And uh, indeed, it was a great connection throughout this complete session because uh, people call it very interactive and they really Thank inspired you. the way you carried on layer by layer explanation really, you know, went beyond the limits. So thank you very thank much you. for being here with us. And uh, it was an enlightening session for all of us. The topic seemed pretty heavy to many of the participants <laughs> as they wrote in the chat mm -hmm. room. But then they said the way Ms. Elam has carried it on further really made it very easy. Yeah. So ladies when and you gentlemen, when you shared with me initially, I was not very you know uh, willing to do it. But then when I researched and you helped me on the data, so we took the right decision. Thank you, Hena. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, Thank you very that. much. Thank you very much for being here. So ladies and gentlemen, let's start working on uh, decisions which are really made on the basis of data we have in our lives, and this data-driven decision making is something which is a part and parcel of everyday life. Let it be the professional life, which is at one side, but in your personal life also, you see the situation, you try to analyze it to its maximum level, and then you try to take decisions. So it's like always grounding and connecting yourselves with the actual situation, and then taking a step ahead, holding on the decision, and then thinking, and then moving ahead is something which helps us, each of us actually. So let's be determined to carry this on further in our own lives. Let me tell you what next is coming to your way through this platform of PPDCI. We are mentoring you in different ways and you know, in, in very, very different, in new dimensions actually. So these dimensions will be, will be these. Now, the next workshops which are coming to your way are going to revolve around these topics. This is going to be integrating AI in work, grounding notions of learning theories, and then English language proficiency courses, well-being sessions. So these well-being sessions are going to be personalized sessions, inshallah. Other than this, there is something very exciting we are planning, and that is this, which is a long-demanded uh, request by all the trainees, we'll have face-to-face -face in-person seminar very soon, inshallah, the dates and the details and the venue will be announced. And that would be a great opportunity for all of us to connect personally with each other. So this is something which is coming to your way. And uh, one more time, the promise we always repeat, PPDCI, which is Personal and Professional Development Center, International Organization, never allows you to be what you are. We always want you to become your better versions. So let's fulfill the promise together. You have received your feedback and attendance form. This is a reminder. I would like PPDCI team to once again share the link. In case if you couldn't fill this attendance link, I would like you to do it again. Take a minute in case if you want to give us any specific feedback. The chat room belongs to you and uh, Bum up your fingers again and write down the feedback. We are live for five more minutes, just for making sure that you all have marked your attendance and you have filled in the details. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. It was a great time with all of you. And I'm so sure the learnings which happened today on the screen, as always, you will take these away from the screen and apply these in the personal lives. Good luck ahead. Thank you. Yeah, PBDCI team is sending the feedback link again. Resources will be shared. Don't worry. We'll be sharing all the resources with you. All right, so link is being shared. I can see thank yous. I can see the hearts over here. 
Thank you very much for such a happy response. I'll save this chat. I couldn't read this during the session, but I'll definitely go through this. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So the change which has come to you today through this complete session, this complete conference is going to be something which is very helpful for all of you. In case if you have some CFUs or in case if you want to connect with all of us, so I'm writing down the official number of PPDCI over here. You can drop your messages and you can connect with me once again. So here's the official number of PPDCI. Let's connect once again with each other. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Bye for now. We'll meet again.